I was trying to look for a good illustration of the grace of God, and the Lord gave me one that was just an amazing illustration of his grace. And you know, this week I was thinking about a different illustration to possibly use, and I just couldn't find one that was better, Mr. Penny. <laughs> and so I went, I'm just going to use that one. How many ever walked up to the ocean and looked at those waves coming in? Wow. I remember, maybe not the first time, but surely it was a time that I really appreciated those waves. Those waves that just keep on coming in, don't they? Keep on coming in. It was several years back, and I've been a diver for, well, since the late 70s. And I remember, oh, several years ago, there was a brother that was part of the church. It actually, it wasn't even, well, it might have been this church when we first started, probably about six years ago. And he was a diver, but he was a brand new diver. And I've been a diver for years. I got certified way back in the late 70s, had 100 plus dives under my belt, and, you know, did cave diving, underwater night diving, you, you name it. And, but anyway, it had been several years, and many, many pounds later, and he came to me and wanted me to dive with him, and he bugged me, and I had all the gear, and so finally I said, okay, I'll go diving. It wasn't really that. I mean, I wanted to go, but I just... So we show up, and it was a real hot summer day. And I think we parked about a quarter mile from the ocean. Anyway, you know it's going to be tough when you're just getting your gear on and you're already wore out. <laughs> And so I remember as I began to get the gear on, I was putting my wetsuit on, and I had a dry suit, which is a lot nicer suit than a wetsuit, but you have to put a big thermal on underneath it to keep you warm because it doesn't have the normal padding a wetsuit has. And then I had to put on my weight belt and my regulator, and, you know, you got a BC on a buoyancy compensator and, you know, just all this other stuff. By the time I got dressed, I was exhausted. I was. And I remember the Holy Spirit speaking to me and saying, Rick, what are you doing? You know, it's hot. The waves are kicked up in the ocean. It's a rough ocean out there. You've got a brand new rookie diver. But you know how we can do it? And I just kind of push past it. Yeah, I got lots of dives. I, I know what I'm doing. So by the time I got to the ocean, I mean by halfway to the ocean, I was really close to heat exhaustion. I really was. But I just kept pushing and going against that little still small voice. And I remember when I finally reached the surf, I literally fell down in the water. I was so exhausted. And those little waves just kept coming. But with every one of those crashing waves, it brought refreshment. It cooled me. It brought buoyancy. Because see, I had some gear on that was, was floating water. And it took all that weight off me. And I just laid there in that surf as the waves moved me around and was just totally refreshed and cool. And the Holy Spirit said, Rick, that's my grace. That's my grace. It just keeps on coming. Just keeps on coming. In the same way, again, God's grace just keeps coming, wave after wave. It just keeps coming. Can you guys see it? Can you see that mental picture? Trust me, like I said, I don't think I've ever appreciated the ocean like I did that moment. <laughs> it was so nice to just lay there. And most of us can understand God's grace being extended to people that seem to deserve it. You know, people that are really good mommies and they've done everything right, it seems like. They've always been really good, righteous people. And the Bible does tell us that God gives favor to the obedient, the willing. It's true. We see many examples of that, right? Mary, the Bible says, was highly favored. And we know that she was a righteous, she was a good 
person. The Bible talks about God's grace being extended to good people all through the Bible, and rightfully so. But the Bible also says that God's grace is extended to the rest of us. Those waves, Eddie, they keep coming, even for us guys that have messed up. And listen, look around. You're surrounded by all kinds of people that have messed up. Remember what we read just a minute ago? Grace is God's gift to those that don't deserve it and can never afford it, never pay for it. That's all of us. That's all of us. That's all of us. Just like a mighty ocean wave, it just keeps on crashing. But, but pastor, you don't understand. You don't know about the horrible things that I've done. Crash. You don't know about the things that I've said. Crash. You don't know about the things I've thought. Crash. There ain't none of us that deserve it. But His grace, it just keeps on coming. Don't think for one second I'm trying to condone sin. I'm not. I'm saying that there's nothing that you've done that His grace cannot cover. There's nothing that you've said that His grace cannot overcome. You hear me? It's more than enough. In fact, if it wasn't for it, all of us would be lost. All of us would be lost. So I want to spend the rest of this sermon talking about what I believe is one of the greatest examples of grace that we can see in God's Word. And we're going to start by looking at John 8 and verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning He came again into the temple and all the people came to Him and He sat down and He taught them. Now imagine this. Get this setting. They were having an early morning Bible study. Somebody probably grabbed the donuts. And <laughs> Somebody else ground up some coffee. I don't know if they had coffee back then, but <laughs> I know I would have needed it. <laughs> They're sitting around, and then it says, The scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had sat her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. This situation just reeks of conspiracy. First of all, it says they did this to test him. I, and I'm speculating, I believe they knew this adulterous relationship was going on. And so right then at that moment when Jesus was there, they said, let's go get that couple that's been sneaking around and let's drag her out right now. Let's, let's get this guy all messed up. He's been preaching love. Let's just see how he handles this. Right? We know that she was married. We know. Because the Bible says she was in the very act of adultery. But just for a moment, I want you guys to just put yourself in her place. We're talking about grace this morning. I want you to just stop and focus and imagine this woman. Don't even talk about the guy. You're talking about conspiracy. Nowadays, all the women's livers would be screaming and hollering, but what about the guy, man? How come he's not? Man? <laughs> put yourself in her place. It's early morning. She's right in the very act of adultery. I mean, I'm just, I'm being honest. That's what it says. And all of a sudden, a mob of guys come into her room and they break the door open and they grab her probably by the hair or whatever they could grab and they drag her out, probably scantily dressed, and they throw her right in the middle of an angry mob. Most of them have these big old rocks in their hands about that big around and all jagged and nasty. Trisha, she's laying there on the ground looking up. 
She knows that she deserves it. But that's what the law states. In fact, her mind's probably been telling her, as it has all of us, you're sinning. And one of these days you're going to get caught. Your sins are going to find you out. So she's laying there, and she's moments away from being stoned to death. And she deserves it, according to the law. Every one of these guys are just sitting there holding this, you see? And I can imagine what she's thinking. I'll never be able to ask my husband to forgive me. Never. She was probably married because most of them, or she was probably had kids because most of them, you know, they didn't have the production control things we have nowadays. <laughs> so she probably had at least one kid, maybe several. And she's thinking, I'm never going to hold my babies again because of what I did. I'm never going to be able to be a parent, a mother, and hold my baby. Imagine, guys. Imagine what was going on. And all of a sudden, Jesus just stoops down and he starts to write. It says, but Jesus stooped down and he wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and he said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. There's lots of speculation about what he wrote on the ground. I believe that he wrote their sins on the ground. The reason is because the Bible says that they went out convicted by their conscience. And sin convicts us, right? Our awareness of sin. Also, it's interesting that the Bible says they went out from the oldest to the youngest. And if you and I have been on this earth longer than others, there's a good chance we probably did more junk. And hopefully we're a little wiser. And so I believe when he wrote on there, you stole from your neighbor, that old guy went, uh-oh. And he realized I'm pointing a finger and saying, stoner, but there's three more pointing back at me, you hear me? Anytime we start judging someone else and pointing at their junk, remember there's always three fingers pointing back at us. They went out and they were convicted. They were convicted of their sin. Let's continue. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. And this is my first point. Jesus wasn't condemning. Jesus didn't come to the earth to condemn us. We see it clearly in the scripture that we all know. We probably all said it a hundred times. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn. He didn't send His Son to condemn the world. But that the world through Him might be saved. Crash. You see the wave? Crash. Crash. Our Father loves us, guys, and He showers us with His grace continually, just like that ocean. It just keeps on a coming. His desire is that we learn to love Him, that we yield our hearts to Him. He wants us to grow and be part of His kingdom for all eternity. And He loved us so much, He sent His own Son to die that we might be part of that kingdom. He's for 
for us. He's not against us. Amen? Amen. 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 Amen, Eddie. Amen. <laughs> he didn't come to condemn us. But listen to me. If you don't need, know your Jesus as your Savior, Lord, Jesus didn't have to condemn you. Because the Bible says you're condemned already. Seemed a little ironic. <laughs> he didn't come to condemn us because, Lisa, if he's not our Savior and Lord, the Bible says we're condemned already. That's what it says. That's what it says. Look at John 3.18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Our Father loves us and He wants us to accept His grace, but it's still our choice. Imagine that you're laying in the edge of the Mojave Desert and you're dying of thirst and somebody comes up and says, Hey, Bev, you want a drink? <laughs> She's got to still yield to that. She's still got to accept it, right? God is extending His grace to all of us. Jesus is the Savior of the world, but He's not your Savior unless you accept Him. Receive it and believe it. Amen? That's what it says. It just keeps on a coming. Keeps on a coming. In the last verse of John 8, Jesus makes a statement. He says, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And that brings me to my second point. You see, Jesus wasn't condoning what she was doing. He wasn't condemning her, but, but he wasn't condoning it either. I want you to make sure and not mistake grace for the opportunity to commit sin. That's not what God's grace is about. Not at all. To live in a way that's ungodly. See, Jesus was not condoning this woman's sin. But he never compromised his values. He lived a sinless life as an example to us. And he told her, he said, I'm not condemning you, but start living different from this moment on. You just got a new chance. You got a second chance. Now go and quit doing what you've been doing. You hear me? Grace is not an opportunity to live in sin. It's an opportunity to live free, not just from the penalty, but the power the enemy has over us in darkness. Amen? Let's don't take his grace and throw it away. Paul put it this way in Romans 6.1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin, live any longer in it. We've been set free, guys. Let's walk in that freedom by His grace. Our Father loves us with an everlasting love. And His grace is like an ocean. Wave after wave, it just keeps coming on the shores of our lives, day in and day out. We need to accept it. We need to learn to live in it and become a conduit of His grace. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by faith, by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We need to leave here today and become a conduit of His grace and His love to others. Amen. We have all been extended grace. Are you extending it to those around you? Or are you? Jesus, again, is the Savior of the world. He died to pay our debt and bring salvation to all of us. 
Brother Dave, could I get you to come up? We're, we're going to sing a song real quietly, guys. I want to give any of you an opportunity. If you don't know the Lord, if you have not accepted Him as your Lord and Savior, listen, no matter what the enemy is telling you, you're a sinner. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, you might be forgiven and you might stand completely clean if you've accepted that and asked for forgiveness. But you're still just a sinner saved by grace. Paul said, I have been chief of sinners. I was at the bottom of the heap or the top of the heap, however you want to look at it. He never forgot from whence he came. He didn't walk around condemned. He was forgiven. But he knew where he came from. Now listen, you know if your heart's telling you you're not right. And this is your chance to make it right. Romans 3.23 says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I'm a pastor, you know, I'm a good person. No, you're not. You've lied. You've dishonored your parents. You've never kept the Sabbath. You've used the Lord's name in vain. You've taken some that wasn't yours. Even if it was just a download you didn't pay for or cheating on a test. We've all broken God's laws. And Jesus said if you've broken one, you're guilty of all of them. That's what he said. We're all sinners. We need his grace. In Romans 6, 23 tells us that the wages of those sin is death. It's separation from God for all eternity in hell. That's what it says. But you know what it also says? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Crash. Now listen, it's just this simple. It's about entering the covenant with our Savior. Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells us that we need to believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then it says, for with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. He's standing here. You're drowning. You're dying. You're in the Mojave Desert. Dying of thirst. And he's got a cup of water. All you got to do is say, yeah, I need it. Please, from this moment on, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And I will live for you. I have sinned and I have fallen short. And I believe you came and lived and died for me. I please, I ask for your grace. In the name of Jesus. I want everybody to bow their heads. Would you please? Now listen. If some of you were sitting here today and you knew you were supposed to come up here, you didn't. Don't let the enemy tell you you missed your chance. You can do this any place. In your car, in your closet, in your bathroom. You hear me? It's just about committing my life to Jesus. Asking for forgiveness. Making Him the Lord of my life. He's an awesome God. Now, every one of you, we want you to move forward. We want to help you. We've got classes. We've got books and materials. Please don't leave here until we can get some stuff in your hands. Brother Robert, would you dig out some God's promises and that big square printed thing there that tells them what they're supposed to do next? I need you to get into Bible studies. The women's Bible studies or the Wednesday night Bible studies. Come and let us help you grow. If you got kids, we'll help with the kids. We want you to move forward in Jesus. Amen? Let's all leave here today and let's extend His grace. Every place we go, let's live it out. Amen? He's worthy.